Uh, this is one of our signature programs and one of the ones that is most, um, most fun for us to plan because it involves so much of, of you. Uh, this is one where we focus our conversations on honoring community while you're sitting together. And you also have conversations about um, historic issues of contemporary importance. Many of them do focus on social justice, um, and such as the one that we have here tonight. So as we prepare to start the evening, I want you to continue to do what you have been doing, which is to talk, uh, enjoy your meal, and look forward to a great program from some wonderful panelists that Leslie Walker is going to join me on stage to introduce. So please have a, a great, I guess, are, you gonna, are they gonna come up right away? Yeah, okay, so please continue throughout the whole evening, just as you are. Meals will be served in just a moment. And welcome, Leslie. Thank you, Deirdre. So the central mission of the museum is to interpret and to exhibit the lives and experience of African Americans here at the museum. And to uh, germane to our topic this evening, we have several items in our collection, but also on display that showcase black grocers, farmers, and food programs led by the Black Panthers. And we encourage you all to return to the, the museum to have a look at a lot of these items that we have on display in our exhibitions on all the floors. And then also to explore our website as well to look at some of the items in our collection that are not on display are currently being in conservation. The museum also leads several critical examinations of social barriers that are faced by African Americans and other communities of colors. And these conversations are not always the easiest to have, but the museum is, cons is constantly committed to facilitating these moments for reflection, like the ones tonight. So tonight, our program, we had the opportunity to observe as well as participate in a thought-provoking conversation about food sovereignty in urban areas like Washington, D.C. Our panel tonight includes Tampa Ray Stevenson, who is a entrepreneur, a food educator, a food justice activist, and she's also the founder of WANDA, which stands for Women Advancing Dietetics and Nutrition and Native Soul Kitchen here in Washington, D.C. She has completed degrees in nutrition and public health, and she's currently completing her PhD in communications at American University. We also have um, Steve, or excuse me, we also have Chris Bradshaw. Um, Bradshaw is the founder and executive director of Dreaming Out Loud, which helps promote access to healthy food, Equity foods, equitable food systems, and economic empowerment here in Washington, D.C. Examples of Dreaming Out Loud include education partnerships with public charter schools and maintaining a two-acre community farm and food market. Both Chris and Tambra are members of the D.C. Food Policy Council. We also have Dr. Ashante Reese. Dr. Reese is a cultural anthropologist and professor of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Her book, Black Food Geographies, examines food access in the Deanwood neighborhood here in DC. Her research highlights black residents and how they navigate as well as how they resist unequal food systems. And tonight, to moderate our conversation is Julianne Malvo, or Dr. J. Dr. J is a social economist, a news commentator, university administrator, superwoman, and frequent, frequent moderator of a seat at the table. So let's welcome Dr. J and our esteemed panel for tonight's conversation to the stage. Well, good evening, everyone. I need more noise. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> that works, that works, that works. First of all, I always want to thank Leslie and Deidre for the opportunity to be in our house this museum, which reflects all of all that we are as a people. I really, really appreciate it. So I want to thank them. And then I want to thank these panelists. We're going to have a good conversation about food. I mean, food is one of our essentials. But we don't often think of it in that context. We just think, I'm hungry. 
something. I want something to eat. And we don't think about where it comes from, who makes it, who produces it. And it's ironic because um, there was once upon a time when black folks have lost, we've lost all our land. We've lost 90% of the land we had post reconstruction. We might not have had jobs during the Great Depression, but we had food. Somebody was growing greens, um, raising a pig, oh well, um, doing something to make sure that there was food on the table. And when I read Depression literature, it strikes me that even though there was lack, there was very rarely hunger. Let's flip it. Today, what is there? There is hunger, and in some ways, there's no lack collectively, although there's lack individually. In other words, we're theoretically the richest nation in the world, and let 53 million Americans cha are challenged with hunger in one way or another. These three activists have figured out ways to attack this frontally, both their, their scholarship and through their actual work. And I'm going to go to Chris first because, first of all, he has a farm in the hood, uh, <laughs> servicing wards six, seven, and eight. Uh, where, which is a food desert. You, it's much easier to find, I don't know, I would say a joint, but I'm not going to go there, than it is to find something fresh in <laughs> certain parts of Ward 8. Uh, tell us what you're doing and how you're dealing with this food justice issue, especially the supply chain issues that you've been talking about. Right. So thank you so much for uh, the invite and being able to join some incredible women on stage. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, I run Dreaming Out Loud, and we are an interesting thing. We are a farm, a food hub, and an incubator. Uh, so as a farm, we grow food uh, on a two-acre space behind Lincoln Heights and Kelly Miller Middle School in Ward 7. Uh, yeah, Ward 7, <laughs> Mary Blackbird, what's going on? Um, and then uh, we're working to refurbish uh, Fort Stanton Urban Farm in Ward 8 behind Fort Stanton Recreation Center. So in total, we're managing about two and three quarters of an acre uh, in the city growing food, but as a food hub, we aggregate produce from five states that uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania that goes into our Black Farm Community Supported Agriculture Program, uh, which is a weekly grocery share, which is actually a black innovation. Uh, Booker T. Wadley is a black man who invented the CSA, a uh, Korean War veteran who knew that farmers like himself needed upfront capital to buy seeds and to buy supplies in order to get started. Um, but he developed this program where you had a social contract with the community uh, that, he, that the community would pay upfront and then he would give them produce on a weekly basis uh, from what he was growing. And so we're building on that legacy, uh, but trying to innovate and, and scale and take things to a different level. So as we aggregate, we want to help build the capacity of our farm partners. So we've uh, this year, subgranted more than $140,000 uh, to other farmers to help them build infrastructure to participate, black farmers and brown farmers across those uh, geographies. Uh, and then we are uh, developing value-added products and managing to penetrate institutional markets uh, to be able to create jobs within the communities where we're situated, but also help those farmers to generate revenue so they can sustain themselves and stay on that land so we're not losing the land like we have, uh, have had in the past. And so uh, as an incubator, we're working to uh, cultivate black, brown, and woman-owned farmers and food makers so that we can all participate uh, democratically in a new food system. Thank you. Now you have been, you're here in DC, you and Chris together serve on the Food Policy Council, and I don't know what that is, so you're gonna help us uh, learn about that, but also put food in the context of social and economic justice. We're talking about food, how does food fit in there? Most definitely. Well first, I give honor to our ancestors to really just lay the pavement for us to walk upon, and it is an honor to be here at the Smithsonian Museum um, and with that said, first I want to talk about it in the context of something that I've been championing, which is this idea of food democracy. We know that over the last few years during the pandemic exposed not only food insecurity as an issue, but also the American democracy being at siege. And so 
both need to be saved. And so this idea of simply just voting with your forks in terms of going to the grocery store, purchasing your items is not enough. We know we have midterm elections coming up next week. And this idea of where do our political candidates stand on issues around food. And one of the key mechanisms that we've done through Wanda and our sisterhood suppers was going to LA, to DC, to Dallas, Oklahoma City, um, and other cities and speaking and having black women have a seat at the table to say, what are the grievances that you have with our food system? How, even though you're a physician, you're someone who is a pillar in our community, how do you feel that there's a mechanism for you to actually channel your grievances in a productive way to create the change that you want to see in your community? And one of the key ways that we have created here in Washington, D.C. and many other cities from Detroit to Oakland, uh, New York City and beyond is the development of food policy councils. They can take on the structure as a nonprofit or a legislative body um, as it has here in D.C. that has um, the ability to provide recommendations to Mayor Mario Bowser um, and also help inform food policies that impact our communities. And I would say that we help create an ecosystem that gives visibility and a platform to create uh, what we now currently see, the Skyland Project, taking up just shopping at Lidl today. Enjoying the fact that we have more grocery stores, understanding that there was a covenant clause in place that blocked competition to the Safeway in Ward 7 to begin with. And to understand that when grocery stores are calculating number of master degrees to ensure that they have profitability, that is a capitalistic issue, not a social justice issue as it should be, and that's problematic. And so this idea of right to food, as we see in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, is something that the U.S. has not fully signed on. And this is why one key reason we are championing the idea of a food bill of rights as a unifying conceptual framework to guide future food and nutrition policies in this country where we have this understanding that we value not only food we value the right for people to have access to healthy food to a livelihood to create food to respect and dignity in the food system the ability to have access to lands to grow food and this this basic decency of food sovereignty. And it's so critical in our community because our ancestors were brought here to not only raise their babies, but help create the food system that we see that we, which is why I support HR 40, we have a key opportunity when it comes to reparations that land access, nutrition access has to be a critical part. And so this idea of democratizing nutrition is one of the things that we champion because part of the work of Wanda is understanding that we have to raise the visibility of the hidden figures in the food system. The George Gilmore's that I did not study in nutrition, the Harriet Tubbins, who was a cook who understood that she had to fund and feed her way to freedom. And to understand that we are standing on the shoulders of fellow food freedom fighters who are fierce, who've worked on the front line and to begin to re-envision ourselves as someone, as every woman, mama, auntie, nana in this room, that you have an inner future in you that needs to be unlocked and unleashed to help heal our communities. Mm -hmm. And that came about from seeing my daughter, four years old with a cavity at Moton Elementary in Ward 8, having a black woman teacher who was also a mom, freely giving out junk food as reward and not seeing that as a problem. And how we can internalize racism, colonization unconsciously and re repair, recreate these dynamics that are the same systems that we fight against. And that really had me thinking that how can I see you as a solution, not a problem? And so the moment I started to think about how can I turn you from a zero to a hero had me realizing that we need to take the cultural mythology work of Joseph Campbell, a hero with a thousand faces, and see ourselves on this journey seeking food freedom. And that is the new Underground Railroad that I'm on, and I welcome you to be a part about it too. Go to imwanda.org slash Food Bill of Rights and sign the petition today. I love it. I love it. I love it even more that you mention HR 40 and reparations. And I would welcome all y'all to check out IB, IBW 21. Uh, there's a tab that says reparations. Some of you know I'm on the National African American Reparations Commission. And some people are focused on the check. It's not just a check. It's making our communities whole. And part of making us whole is access to land, which is something that we always had. That we always had and do not have very much anymore. Now, Ashante, you, these two are down here on the ground activists. They don't plant plants, I don't think. They might. They're that kind of folks. But, uh, but what they do, but they, but they basically are down here on the ground. You are at the University of Texas 
essentially giving some academic grounding and wings to this. Talk a bit more about what we're not studying and what we need to study around food policy, food justice, and these things. Oh yeah, that's a big question. That's a great question. Um, so I'm a cultural anthropologist, which can mean a lot of good things and not so good things, depending on who you ask. But what I think of as my job is, I, I was a middle school teacher before I got a PhD. And it was teaching middle school where I decided I was going to study food. And the reason I started um, thinking I would study food is I taught sixth and seventh graders. It was the first time I had encountered a 12-year-old who had type 2 diabetes. Um, I taught in a Title I school in Atlanta, Georgia. I taught all girls. So I taught in a single gender. It was an ex experiment in single gender education in Atlanta public schools. And I taught in a... Um, a setting in the context of all of the public housing being eliminated in Atlanta. Now that sounds like it's not related and it is amazingly impactful for how students experienced how they were going to get their next meal, how they were going to get to school even, if they were going to be able to stay in our school if they had to be, if they were forcibly relocated elsewhere. Um, and so I had students who were asking me questions around food and food access that I didn't have the answer to and that's why I decided I was going to be um, going to study that in graduate school. So when I say I'm an anthropologist, what I think of is I'm the link. I'm not opposed to the work that they're doing. I'm the link to say I'm watching, I'm studying, and how do we take what you're doing and kind of translate it out into the public. That is essentially the work of what black intellectuals and black scholars who have been interested in social justice and liberation have been doing for decades. And so I walk in that kind of tradition that my scholarship is in service to the work that people are doing every day on the ground. So in terms of what we see, so much of the work on food access is focused on supermarkets and grocery stores. And there's a good reason for that. Who in here does not shop at a supermarket or a grocery store? Most of us do, right? The problem with that is that it reinforces this idea that supermarkets and grocery stores are the solution to the problem. Mm. We put all of our emphasis on, or a majority of our emphasis on getting more supermarkets, getting more grocery stores in areas that might need them. And what that does is it says, we trust a capitalist food system to take care of our most basic human need. And we trust it so much that we will put our activism around getting a Safeway, a Giant, a Whole Foods, a Trader Joe's, all of these companies. Tambra, I want to lift up something Tambra said about every, every company has a market strategy, right? They think about where they want to go. They think about who's there and who they're going to serve. And most of the people that I am thinking about are not necessarily included in a lot of those marketing strategies for a place like Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. So one of the things that I learned from the work of, of people like Tamara and um, Chris and others is trying to think more expansively and more holistically about what our food system could look like. And I want to also emphasize that a lot of times we think about this in the past, that we got to go so far back, and actually we don't. Black people live and eat and work cooperatively every day in all kinds of spa spaces, from neighborhoods to public housing to I watched my seventh graders organize a whole protest of the cafeteria because they wanted healthier food. We don't have to always look so far back, right? I think the key in looking back is to see, like, are there lessons we can learn to improve upon the things that people have been doing? So that's one thing I would say. And I would say the last thing here I'll, um, before I stop talking is, the emphasis on food insecurity means that there's an urgency, there's a literal urgency, but then there's also a kind of manufactured urgency that can curtail the actual activist work to create a more diverse food landscape. Meaning that if you're in the room with policy makers, you're in the move, room de, um, decision makers, they might give you a false binary. You either, do you want this thing that might be the more sustainable um, answer for the future, or do you want people to get fed? And I actually think we don't have to create, we don't have to live in that binary at all. Um, and so one of the things I would encourage us to think about is the ways that, um, I don't know if there are policy people in the room. Policy doesn't always work in our favor. 
And policy isn't the only way we're gonna get people fed and it's certainly not gonna pave the way for liberation. So even as we are like working toward policy changes, as we should, there are the, the work of dreaming and the work of uh, just creating alternatives is actually usually in community. So I think that's where I would stop. Great. Well, you know, one of the things you said, I think I want all of you to reflect on, I think my t lovely timekeeper over here is gonna say something to me in a minute. Uh, we are going to open it up to uh, the audience to participate. But, you know, when we think about, there's an exhibit that Leslie mentioned, the Black Panthers uh, free food program, the breakfast program, the things that um, the Panthers said in their 10-point program. We want freedom. We want the power to determine our destiny. And part of our destiny is, you know, what we eat, uh, what we have access to eating. Mm -hmm. I live off of 14th Street. And so some of, I, I've been in D.C., kind of, for about 25 years. And I remember when Whole Foods came to 14th and Peak. And there were some who wanted it to go to 14th and W because it was a little bit closer to some other people. And there were petitions and da da da. And it ended up, of course, at 14th and Peak. And then we got Trader Joe's. So we have all these stores off 14th Street and not too many off of uh, Martin Luther King. What can people do? Y'all are act you you two are activists, you're a scholar activist. What can people do to make sure, ignoring perhaps the supermarkets, or maybe not, but what can we do to make sure we have more and better access to food? And I don't mean we, these privil pe privileged people in this room. I mean the collective we, the people who basically, you know, if you go to some of these stores in the hood, the Apple has just collected Social Security <laughs> before it was placed on sale. Chris? What can we do to make sure that people have better food? I think one of the things we can do is vote with our dollars. Um, you can go to csa.dreamingoutloud.org right now and order produce from farmers, uh, from community uh, uh, producers uh, that allows us to stop what's happening in the circumstance that Tambor talked about. Uh, she's an important word, colonization. Um, Giant and Safeway, those are extractive entities, right? They extract wealth. Uh, they take that capital and they ch uh, channel it to a shareholder um, that's already in a mansion somewhere. Uh, we want to take that capital and reinvest it in our communities uh, and, and b build a more holistic ecosystem. And so that's really important. Um, projects like Market 7, uh, Mary Blackford is uh, starting a food hall in Ward 7 uh, that needs to be recognized and, and saluted. Yes, um, that's going to be an opportunity for you to support some of the same types of activities there in a physical space. We're working on a production space at 13th and Good Hope Road Southeast uh, that will allow us to become the producers, uh, but not in a way that is uh, so capitalistic in terms of, uh, of why it exists. You know, it's not there to enrich uh, an organization or an individual. It's a part of uh, an economic development strategy. Right, that uh, is also a part of utilizing the food system as a lens to examine intersectional justice and these issues that we're talking about. Uh, to have a conversation about the policies and decisions that have shaped our communities. You know, we're the survivors of public policy that, whether it has been intentional or uh, unintentional, has done great damage. You know, in Ward 7, where we're uh, situated with the farm at Kelly Miller, uh, transportation policy uh, impacted that community's ability to uh, build generational wealth and greater food access just as much as what USDA did. Um, and so I think uh, we're at a really important moment coming off the back of the White House Conference on Nutrition, Hunger, and Health, uh, where we are having these conversations in a way that is uh, productive because we're talking about it in an interagency uh, way, in an interagency perspective. So Chairman uh, Jim McGovern from Massachusetts uh, proposed the conference, and the conference brought together multiple agencies because we need to attack this from a workforce development perspective and a, an economic justice perspective, uh, from transportation, uh, from all these different layers and levels that allow for a wraparound solution because this public policy uh, uh, quagmire or, or, or challenge that we're in has developed over decades and it's multi-layered. Uh, and so it's going to take a lot to unpeel those layers uh, and really generate holistic healing for our communities. Great, thanks. I want to go back to Ashante, piggyback on you because it just flashed to me that we, I went to Buffalo with Black Lives Matter after that shooting. 
And the whole issue of food policy became so very clear that one grocery store in that area of Buffalo, one. And so they had to try to, re to create systems to get food to people. Yeah. Many of the people did not have cars, yeah. nor bus routes. Mm -hmm. um, and predatory capitalism suggests that that company, it escapes me now, who owned the one store mm -hmm. in East Buffalo and several in other parts of Buffalo, mm -hmm. and one sister told me there was about a 20% markup from East Buffalo mm -hmm. to the other place, or the other way around, food costs more. Given your work, what, uh, putting Buffalo in the mix as we talk about what can people do, what could the people of Buffalo do? What could they be doing now? Uh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm going to um, connect this to the 2020 and when the pandemic started and, and kind of create a landscape of Buffalo being in, in all of these things. So I was living in Baltimore when the pandemic began. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of trauma in Baltimore, right? And, 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 and a lot of other great things too, but the reason I mentioned the trauma is that in 2020 pandemic happens, clashes with the racial justice protests that are also happening. And I lived in downtown Baltimore and so I would walk everywhere. And the first thing that started to happen before there was any protest was that all the stores were boarded up, including the store street, streets that I would walk to, the grocery store that I would walk to. And it flashed me back to 2015 when a similar thing had happened when Freddie Gray was murdered and, and also the kind of solution that was motivated. Um, shout out to Heber Brown and the uh, Black, Ch Black Church Food Security Network. And he started driving around in his church van getting food, fruits and vegetables and other foods from wherever he could to get to people in the parts of Baltimore where all these stores had already boarded up and people were not able to get food. And, that's the, and that birthed this whole thing where now he, that's the work that he's doing, right? Trying to mobilize churches and, and, as institutions mm -hmm. that can leverage the space that they have. Often, sometimes, the only land we might actually own in the community are church spaces, right? And he's trying to think through what does urban agriculture look like on the land of where churches are, where we don't have to worry about if the city then decides they want to redevelop this plot of land where we've had our garden and now you get kicked off, which happens a lot, right? Um, so I think that's one thing. The other thing to think about, I want to connect it back to what you were saying about the Black Panthers. So often the food programs are uplifted and it's like, see, this is what we do for our community. Yes and political education. That was not, yes. the programs were not just about getting people food, yes, but the Panthers were very clear. You cannot mobilize people who are hungry. You right. cannot, you cannot organize people who are hungry and cannot think past the fact that they don't know where their next meal is going to be. And so this is the part where if I had to pinpoint something that I think we should all be diligent about around how food justice gets watered down, if somebody calls their program food justice and there's no political education or political action attached to it, that's not food justice. They're just reproducing models of charity. And the models of charity are not inherently problematic, except it does not necessarily um, impact people in a way where they can be self-determining. And so I think I would say one thing is to think about the landscapes in which um, where we see a lack of grocery stores, we also see over-policing, over-surveillance, and all of these uh -huh. other things. And so when crisis happens, food is impacted by that and exasperated by that. So I think trying to think about what our landscapes look like and what do communities of care look like within that nexus. And then also political education is something that we're going to have to um, engage because we, we cannot ignore the impact of the microwave culture that we live in. We want things uh -huh. instantly, and we want them conveniently, and everything about our food system hides all of the labor that's a part of it that makes it clear that like we go, to the, we go get an avocado, you don't know where that avocado was grown. You, maybe you don't know that the farm workers in Mexico who grew that avocado are organizing in Mexico because they can't afford the avocado that they put on our table. Come on. Right? So I think we just have to like really connect our issues to global issues as well. So these folks are so darn brilliant. 
They're very difficult for me to interrupt them. And yet there's this lady over here called a timekeeper. And I'm going to try to respect that. And although you've come last, and I'm going to beg you to not be mad at me when I say, please be as brief as you can in answering the question. And then I know that some people can be wandering around with microphones to get audience participation, I think. Somebody, yeah, there's a microphone right there. OK, sis, you have your turn. Give me a minute and a half. <laughs> I know it ain't fair, but you know what? Life ain't fair either. I mean, I am a comms PhD student, so I should try to take this on. Well, I first want to say our existence is a resistance. When you think about the culture in our communities, what kind of culture do you want to cultivate? Health or death? When policymakers who look like us speak on behalf of us, saying that they're choosing economics over our health, such as the nutrition equity bill that did not pass, did not come about because it was racialized, remember of that we are seeking generational health and wealth. It's not one or the other. We can talk and chew gum at the same time. The issues of black farmers, we can still talk about the issues of the lack of nutritionists of color at the same time. And so with that, if I say nothing else, first leverage your cell phones as digital activism devices. Mm. Follow us, IamWanda.org on across all social media. Sign up to our newsletter, IamWanda.org, our newsletter, and understand that part of being a active citizenship is to be an engaged and informed citizenship to create the changes that we want to see in our communities. Lastly, we are big on literacy and education, and so since this is the month of National Diabetes Month, and having had a grandmother die of complications, Minnie Mae Crawford in Oklahoma, who dealt with trauma, who dealt with self-medicating with those delicious pies and cakes and desserts, that I wanted to honor her and be that food hero that would have saved her. So this is one of the reasons why I created a character, Little Wanda, to help motivate my daughter and others to see themselves as that next generation of food heroes. And so you can also support us and donate a gift for Christmas time, a birthday, and find Little Wanda Finds a Cure for Nana, who finds yeah. her cure in Nigeria, my heritage, that I reconnected to my ancestral land and said, why are we not finding ways to see that our African traditional foods should be part of our medicine too, as we've demonized soul food and black food culture, and understand that this is one of the ways we can take back creating the literature, reframe the issue, create better representation, not only of our people, but our food culture as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give her a round of applause. She actually <laughs> did the time thing, and I really appreciate it. And also sowed some seeds. So we have microphones here because it's an opportunity for you all to ask the panelists questions uh, and to engage, to begin to engage in conversation, which will continue. But right now, you have, we have about 10 minutes. I don't know my timekeeper. I'm hoping she's taking a little nap or something um, <laughs> so she lose track of time. But there are two microphones sitting up here. Oh, there was. There's one. Oh, there's another one. OK, folks, y'all so quiet and docile. I, and I don't even believe that, because I recognize some people in the audience. <laughs> Questions, comments? Maybe they're in a food coma. I don't think that the museum would feed them enough food to get into a food coma. <laughs> Sister. Hi. Thank you all for all the comments. And uh, Chris and Tambra, I wonder if you could speak at all about the work of the DC Food Policy Council. Maybe tell us like one example or something of like what, what is it doing to address these issues that you guys are bringing up? And would you identify yourself too? <laughs> Renee Katakalos, and I have been involved in local regional food here in the Chesapeake region for about the past 20 years or so. Yeah. Okay, and, go ahead. Good. No Thank you. Goals. Chris? Or, uh, I, I Either way. Yeah, so uh, the DC Food Policy Council at present, uh, it formulates uh, recommendations for the city. DC's good at passing things, but not so good at implementing them. So that's been one of the hardest challenges. One example is the Urban Farm and Food Security Act, which passed in 2014. Uh, it was tasked with um, uh, forcing the DC government to list land available for urban farming uh, with the idea amongst the folks like ourselves that were working to get it passed and uh, Gail Taylor playing a major role at Three Part Harmony Farm and pushing that forward uh, is to make sure that it was open and available for community members uh, to be able to apply. But again, you have the challenges of bureaucracy, you have the challenges of access uh, to the information to even know how to apply. Um, the Food Policy Council does a, a, a better job than it has at 
uh, doing that outreach and getting out into the community to let people know, um, but at the same time, uh, the way that the reg legislation was written to establish it, um, it doesn't have as much power as it needs to have to enforce and, and make the agencies uh, implement the legis legislation. You still need on the ground power and people in communities using their voice to make sure that the Department of Transportation actually puts the properties that it has on the list. So that's one of the challenges. Now that the Food Policy Council has more capacity, has been working to develop, uh, or actually now has its own grant making authority, it can go accumulate resources to better distribute that aren't so much tied to the bureaucracy. So I think we're at an important uh, moment for the Food Policy Council so that it can do more uh, progressive work and do work in a way that um, is more visible to folks. Um, but you need the communications capacity, is, which is a major piece of what is needed to not just be uh, curating an email list, but you need to be on the ground passing out flyers in neighborhoods and without resourcing the Pol Food Policy Council or organizations that can do that grassroots organizing, uh, you don't see the impact in a forceful way that many community members and folks like myself want to see a tidal wave, right? But I think we're still building that and we're at a, at a critical moment. And I would just say go to dcfoodpolicy.org, sign up to the newsletter. We have Sunshine Laws. You are, we have transparency. You can hop on Zoom, you can do, our, come to our in-person meetings. It's open to everyone. Also, me and Chris are the longest running food policy council members. My term is up next spring. That means someone, hopefully in this room, could see themselves as a food policy maker. It is someone who wants to be engaged. You do not need to be a food person, but someone who cares and wants to understand how the legislative process operates and be a part. This is what citizenship in action looks like. Great. I have a timekeeper and I have two people in line. We're going to try to get to them. The timekeepers that understand that I'm doing my best. Sister. Hi, good evening. Thank you all so much for this. My name is Jessica Artis. I'm an uh, attorney at a federal agency. Um, prior to that, though, I was raised by a black single mom who worked two jobs and often struggled to put a nutritious meal on the table. Um, even though I don't yet have kids, I still find myself with the same kind of time, exhaustion, need to eat, nutrition struggles. And so I'm curious as, as you know, black food experts, what do you recommend for those of us who want to eat healthy, who um, you know, want to do right by our families, but maybe just don't have the time? Shanti, I'm going to ask you to take that. Oops. I'm just going to say really quickly, um, at some point last year, I tweeted something that was like, for those of us who consider Popeyes when we were too exhausted to cook, that's a real thing, right? So the reason, the reason I want to mention that is because the reality is our people are working longer, we're away from home longer, there's a lot of exhaustion. I also want to mention that the expectation of perfection is also anti-black. Mm -hmm. And the ways that we kind of expect perfection of ourselves and from other black people is not sustainable. And so I think maybe just smaller choices. I'm going to let Tamara actually say more about the nutritional part. But I think allowing yourself some grace is the first thing. And then the second thing is um, what we a lot of times what we call healthy, we're not connecting to our own desires and tastes as well. And so I think even just finding the things that you actually like. I also really love recipes that take less than 30 minutes. Um, so Tuesday Night Kitchens, I think, is a, a cookbook that I use a lot. The New York Times cooking app actually is pretty great. Like, I can find lots of recipes that I could do in less than 20 minutes. And so that's what I first, Grace, don't expect perfection. That's anti-black. Tell yourself that. And then also find things that you actually enjoy. Deborah, you mentioned your daughter. And so from that context, if you would very quickly add to uh, what Ashante has said about healthy eating for us. <clears throat> Most definitely. And I'm glad Ashante opened up with the realness because reality in nutrition, which is a white bread world, New York Times called that out. We recognize that we have to unpack, unlearn some of the colonization that happens in our nutrition education. With that said, feeding a son and a daughter who are now 12 and 13, I definitely focus on getting those basic needs met get a green, a grain, a whole grain in particular, and a protein, and a quality one at that. And at this point, my son can make some good salmon better than me. And so this is what 
that looks like in terms of those ready to eat meals that either you prepare yourself quickly, time scarcity is a real factor among all people, especially black women, and also being able to support groups that are coming out like Southeast um, Co-op and others who are black owned meal delivery programs. And I just wanna call out on the digital apps because my space is studying media technology and democracy, you have digital apps that literally don't have icons representing African Caribbean foods. That's what erasure looks like in our food system when we can't even identify the food culture that speaks to us. And so that activism also needs to be happening in the big tech space as well. I want to apologize to the brother who was approaching the mic. I've got one more person here and then I know that Timekeeper is going to give me the hook. And uh, sister, you've been standing in lines. I want to hear from you uh, very briefly, though, if, if you would. Hi, I'm Dr. Wanda Alderman. I'm an urban sociologist. And what I've recognized is that across this country, a lot of in urban areas, community, uh, community schools are closing, where children of color have to go further and further away from their community in order to get an education. But that also impacts their access to food, especially whether it's in the summer or after school or on weekends. Do you know of any infusion of programs that are addressing that issue when the community school is taken away and access to food is also taken away? Thank you very much. And community school is very important. We talk about this. Leslie Walker is going to come here because the next thing that happens is that there's a table activity that y'all are supposed to gain, uh, engage in. Leslie? Are you coming or do I have some more minutes? Oh, there, he said, I don't have no more minutes. Hmm? I have a little more time? Okay, my brother. <laughs> Hi, my, ooh, sorry about that. My name is Lawrence Green. Um, th this is a new experience for me. I'm learning more about food policy. And I'm just curious, is the ultimate goal for us to go back to, um, maybe not go back is the right word, but to us to basically, for us to basically <clears throat> get our food and farm and grow our food ourselves and feed our families that way? Like, what is the ultimate goal here? You know, since we talked about how supermarkets are not necessarily the answer since we're living in this capitalism, capitalistic society. I live in Ward 8. When we got that, you know, when we get grocery stores, it's a big deal. Um, but yet, you know, I'm being told perhaps that's not the right attitude to have. So, you know, we don't have a lot of space in our yard. Should we be growing our food? Is that something we should all be doing? I don't know how realistic that is. That's a really great question, and it's conceptually it's something for us to rethink is how we get our food. Remember, predatory capitalism is about the extraction of surplus value. Exactly. The extraction of surplus value. That's what supermarkets are doing. But there are other alternatives to getting your food besides growing it. I mean, there's a whole continuum between getting at the supermarket, growing it yourself, or doing something else. Like, I had this very uncomfortable period in my life where I was so mad at Whole Foods. It was around the corner from my house. I love their chicken salad. But I was so mad at them that I started getting a farmer's boxes. But I will not go into Whole Foods again. Now, I lapsed off that. But for a year, I refused to eat Whole Foods. Though the CEO said something ugly about Obama. That's what started it. And I'm like, I ain't eating none of y'all food no more. Uh, so there are alternatives that don't require, if I had to grow greens, I'd starve. Yeah. Uh, and I love greens. You were going to say something. Yeah. So just because, contextually, the continuum is yeah. really what because I think you're about. Because I'm a fellow Ward 8 resident, and I give presentations about this issue around equity on the plate, I want to first visualize the before and the after picture and using Little Wanda as the avatar on this journey experience. Currently, we live in a food apartheid, understanding that there are structural dynamics that are disabling our environments for us to have food freedom. The after picture is being on that path just like Harriet had to turn some people around and turn them up into the promised land, that is where we're trying to go. And part of that, when I speak to food democracy, is the ability to have choice. In a capitalistic system that looks, that is top down, we have no choice. We're giving only a few choices, just like game theory. And so the idea is how do we have collective power and agency by also creating other alternatives that speak to community and being able to lead the change that we want to see. And so that means as we walk through Little Wanda's neighborhood where 
we can we know the plethora of deficits but the assets that we want to see is being able to go to the local community garden to go to the teaching kitchen seeing black beautiful faces promoting fruits and vegetables being able to see that black nutritionist being able to turn on the TV and see tab time and Michelle Obama and to be able to read my little Wanda books and to be able to have the teacher that incorporates nutrition education into her math into her English and everything else and to be able to advocate and know who my policymaker is to talk about what legislation and creating a youth food policy council on top of the DC food policy council so the youth voice also speaks to the change that they want to see to me that is the world that we want that's the world we're not living in that is why the power of dreaming is not only a privilege it is a necessity for us to reimagine the spaces that we must achieve because if I if I did not take time post my father dying and saying I will not live a life with regrets but a life on my own terms then I would not have imagined and dreamed of Wanda I literally dreamed Wanda before Wakanda I had dreamed of black women leading and and curating and creating the communities that I wanted and I aided and I manifested to the point I believed it and I have Wanda women who do who in the room and so this is what it looks like dream the unimaginable because once you manifest that dream it become a possibility and the next generation takes it on to make it the legacy go over here thank you that was powerful hi hello my name is norma Tissant. i'm a, a food security advisor for a nonprofit here in dc and i also live in ward 8. um i have a comment and a question so i just want to thank dr reese for her book food geographies it inspired me to pursue a certificate in food systems at tufts university and i quoted that book in every single paper that I wrote, so I just want to thank you for that. Um, just really bringing the black experience and really DC experience and talking about that with my, my cohort. And also, my question is, what are you working on now? What research, interesting research projects do you have? I'm just really curious. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm writing a book about sugar. Um, and it's really connecting the historical legacy of incarcerated people doing the labor of sugarcane work in Texas to the kind of current ways that we live in a landscape where there's an either or about sugar. It's either really demonized and black people's bodies and labors attached to sugar have been um, villainized for so long. So I'm working on that book while at the same time meditating on what does it look like to think about the role of sweetness in black life in a way that isn't about deficit. That we actually think about the fact that our our family reunions, our repasts, all these things include some form of sweetness. So is there some way that we don't have to live in this binary while also thinking about the ways that the racial landscape has shaped the production of sugar such that we are still living with the implications of that violence? Thank you. Sister? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Sidoni. I'm a federal government worker. Um, my hobby is taking pictures of restaurants where I go to to um, take pictures of the food. And you talked about food and disparity, but let me tell you, there's a, there's a lot of cooks out there who can't cook. <laughs> so I don't care what you say about, you know, we need a certain type of food. You, we got to also teach them too. So I hope that's incorporated into your plan. And by the way, I have 42 million views. Thank you. Go on, girl. Okay, sister here. And Leslie, keep me posted. Greetings. You may be the last question. Go I'm ahead. Dr. Bahia Muhammad. I'm an associate professor here at Howard and a criminologist. And I'm just wondering if you all could talk a little bit about ways we can activate individuals to think about our incarcerated populations with so many black individuals affected by mass incarceration and living off of the commissary with very high sodium food. The chances of them reentering back into the community and falling sick or to death is a reality, and we don't talk about food security in carceral spaces. Yeah. Chris, I, yeah. I was immediately, um, what came to mind is the work of uh, Ronnie Webb at the Green Scheme uh, and the Friends and Families of Incarcerated People, Stuart Anderson. They've been working really hard on elevating the issue around uh, the food in, our, in the uh, prison system. I think there's multiple things that need to happen, right? There's what happens on the inside, there's what happens in the transition, and how do we set up systems that uh, are able to 
wrap our arms around our folks coming home and guide them into uh, what they need to be supported, whether that's housing, whether that's food, and recognizing that, fo fo that folks, when they come home, are often in uh, situations where they can't cook, right? So you can't do any better than the carry out. So it goes back to the question of the young woman in the red is how do you um, address a situation like that when you don't have the time, you don't have the resources, or, or, or whatever the circumstances may be, and we need to think about those things on, on the front end, and I think that's why it's important for, for uh, work like what's going on with Stuart and, and Ronnie uh, is to elevate that from a policy perspective so that the resources are there so that we can put the systems in place to help people that are informed by folks whose lived experience that is. And I think that's what's really powerful about what they're doing and thank you for what you do um, in, in, in uh, posing that question and the work that you do every day as well. Thank you. That is a powerful question. I'm going to ask the other two to deal with it because I, there are a couple things. The food that people get, mass-produced food is nasty. Uh, it's, as you say, it's sodium rich. The commissaries do not have anything in them that's healthy. I mean, ramen noodles is like a luxury. Um, so, it, but from a context of predatory capitalism, the questions we have to ask is, who has a contract to feed incarcerated people? Are they publicly traded? What their profit margins are? Who cuts the deals? to get the contracts. Who are they related to in the legislature, the state legislature? Back in the day when our brothers were doing parchment farms, you know, and all of that, they weren't getting the food that they were, that they were harvesting. They were getting whatever. And yeah, there's so many books about how the, the theft involved in the food systems. So there's just a whole set of things to be dealt with. So I'm glad you raised the question because someone earlier said, we, we're, you know, we're all privileged in this room, let's face it. We're all, if you're not, you're lying. Um, <laughs> but, but we're privileged people and we don't often think about the others. And so this is really important. So I want both of you ladies to kind of tackle what she said before Leslie Walker, people always try to give me the hook. Yeah. These are ways sometimes. Uh, I'm going to try to important keep it brief because I, I probably have a lot more to say about this um, that we could talk about after. First, on the scholarship part, myself and a colleague, Josh Sabika, just put out the only volume that I know of that focuses on the intersection of food and carcerality. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was a big task to do that. And, is, and Josh is working on what he calls the Prison Agriculture Lab to map all of the um, institutions in the US who have some form of prison agriculture. What most people don't understand or don't know, I won't say don't understand, is that when we talk about the parchment prison, for example, and we talk about the past, every, almost every state has prison agriculture currently. It's not just a southern thing, and it's not just a past thing. Texas owns 180,000 agricultural acres that does not include any of their facilities, just the land that they grow food on. And that food goes into, some of it goes into the prison, but a lot of it goes into state institutions like where I work. And so there are these ways that we also have to think about where are the pipelines that are uh, occurring and how do we kind of intervene and redirect some of that stuff from the pipeline. The other thing that I would say is um, I'm part of a working group that are people who think about prisons and food. And one of the things we've been trying to figure out is how do we support movements on the inside? Because almost all movements on the inside organize around food. And a lot of them are organizing around like using hunger strikes or whatever. And um, one of the biggest things that has happened around the institutional food in prisons is the the lessening, not only of choice, but just food items themselves. So some states use a form of food called Nutri-Loaf, which is supposed to have all of the nutrients that a person could have in one, one day, or need in one day, in a dense loaf. So, I mean, it looks like a loaf that is just put on a plate. And so one thing we could do is really trying to, because what, they're, what that does is reduces someone's body to just enough energy for you to just keep living, right? Like you just get reduced to a biological subject. And so one thing I think strategically could do is to fight against institutional, that should not be constitutional, for example. So to fight against institutional practices in that way. So I would say support what work is happening on the inside, 
fight some of these things like policies that allow things like neutral loaf to exist. Neutral. Um, and I would, I would stop there. Thank you. Sister Quickly? Yeah, I would, yeah, wrap this one up. Obviously, being so many pieces here. One, the same companies that hire dietitians to be in the hospitals, the same one operating the prisons and the schools. So we know them, Aramark and, and Sodexos of the world and, and so forth. There was a great presentation on this very topic looking at Maryland and prison population and, and black population in particular around food policy that came out of Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future. I think the clip is available on their website if you want to check it out. But this piece is of great interest because having been trained in public health and nutrition, we knew in the height of the AIDS epidemic, you had a combination of not only being concerned of your family member coming into the community, but what else were they bringing with them? And so we had a combination of looking at the AIDS coming, almost like a COINTELPRO, now layered on you're bringing diabetes and heart disease and hypertension also with you. And so this creates more of a double burden on the community. And this is why we as citizens have to be aware of these issues, willing to say, this is not my issue, this is very much your issue, because it's like dropping super sales in your community. And so if we don't see the necessity to take on issues like this, supporting the work of fellow activists like Ronnie and others who are doing, we are really not speaking to helping the less fortunate in our communities who need that reform, rehab, and reconnecting back into our communities to see that change. Otherwise, the recidivism rates will just continue and still be a burden on the healthcare system. As we know, the cost of keeping a prisoner in the system is way higher than educating just a third grader and higher. And so this is why this issue of looking at how do we change not only the food culture in our communities, but at our prisons, they're all connected. And we can all walk and chew gum at the same time doing it. Thank you so much. Sister, thank you for that provocative question. And thank all of you for the answers. Uh, Leslie is in charge now. Thank you, Sister Timekeeper, for giving me cues that I could ignore. Uh, <laughs> Leslie. Thank you all. Give it up for our panelists. So at this moment, I want to bring to your attention, um, on your tables, you might see um, recipe cards. So tonight's caterer is uh, Get Plated, which is a black-owned and operated catering uh, company. And Miss Alex is probably around here somewhere. Um, but um, we wanted to highlight an opportunity. Let me step away from the speaker. We wanted to highlight an opportunity um, to, again, promote and support black business, but also black business that takes into account um, seasonality of food as well as food that's healthy for you. And for the young lady that was stating, you know, not all cooks are good cooks, hopefully this <laughs> recipe helps you out. <laughs> and then um, at this time, our panelists, they will uh, clear the stage and they'll have the opportunity to eat. I encourage you to speak with them, but not while they're eating. And as and, um, Ms. Tambra, she'll also um, walk around to each of your tables. She also has a, a nice goodie um, for you all to take home and um, promoting um, um, I Am Wanda. Um, so I'll allow the wait staff to come and clear uh, dishes. You'll have the opportunity for a coffee and tea, and then there will be dessert. And then we, uh, up, they're telling me the coffee and tea is at the, um, at the receiving tables. Um, they'll come by and provide dessert, and then volunteers and staff members will come along and uh, provide the prompts for the uh, audience activity. So you have about a little bit more time to finish your meals and to get up and go to the bathroom and get another drink, and then we'll move on to the next segment. So again, thank you um, for coming and being wonderful audience members, and thank you for our panelists. So. What do you think will be the most important for these policies? How can we involve young people in these actions? Well, on our table, we had a young lady who's lived in Senegal. We have a guy who lived in Nigeria. And we have uh, another lady who lived in Japan. But nobody at our table knows how to make hot water cornbread. So, 
So it, it all depends on the school, really. Um, right now, we've learned that a lot of the um, schools in Ward 8 and different wards do not have a proper kitchen facility. So let's work on that. And another lady mentioned that, okay, we have a, if we do get a proper kitchen facility, let's bring all the teachers and counselors on board to kind of help design it. Because right now, a lot of the schools in DC are getting pre-packaged food. Hot dogs, microwave pizza, all that good stuff, okay? So we as part of the modern, modern design, um, the school system. Also, um, quality control of the food, too. Where's the food coming from? We don't know that. One young lady said that she um, registered for HelloFresh, but they didn't give her the instructions how to cook collard greens. I looked at her like, you know how to cook collard greens? But that's a different story. But uh, other than that, food justice and giving us proper instruction, once again, it all depends. You can, give, you can throw me the best steak in the world. If you don't teach me how to cook it, it means nothing. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I just sat there. OK, so uh, <laughs> uh, what words or images come to mind when you think of hunger? Um, are there people you know in your community who are dealing with food insecurity and what small steps can you take to help them? Uh, we had a lot of conversation, uh, but uh, when it comes to mind when I think of hunger, I just think when I was younger, um, most of the times I ate, I'm from Tennessee, so most of the times I ate was at school. And when you came home and you had a meal, you were happy, but um, otherwise sleep on your stomach and wait till the next day when it was breakfast at school. But the image, I didn't think of that as hunger. I just thought of what it was. But the image that came to mind with hunger were the children in Africa on TV with the big bellies and the flies. And I'm like, now that I'm an adult and I can put a mirror to my face, the image of hunger that should have came to my mind was should have been my face instead of the kids over in Africa. So a lot of times media spins of what our condition is and um, lets us uh, puts in our mind what we think something should be when it, we are sitting in our own realities. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then, yeah, I just made that up. Are there people you know in your community who are maybe dealing with food insecurity? Um, I know uh, where I am um, and what I do, we house a lot of people through like Miriam's Kitchen and Community Connections who are um, on, not only are homeless, but also have food insecurities. And like during the pandemic and times like that, um, I would bring them food when I went to the grocery store. So things we could do in our communities is think of our neighbors, think of our others. Like God said, love your neighbor like you love yourself. So you can always, when you pick up something for yourself, always pick up something for your neighbor too, especially the elderly, the handicapped, the young, uh, the kids who you see in the neighborhood eating potato chips when uh, you know they could be eating something else healthy. And at Halloween, pass out raisins instead of uh, Tootsie Rolls. All right, the next thing is, <laughs> uh, last thing, I'm just doing this, I'm just doing this. Uh, what small steps can you take to help them? Like I said, just think of love your neighbor like the Bible says, love your neighbor like you love yourself. So whenever you are going to the store, you have extra $5, just throw something extra into the, um, the basket. Or when you cook, cook enough for your neighbor because they get hungry too. All right. Good evening, I'm Sana Pratlow, and I'm at this beautiful table over here with uh, all these guys, right? So, so our question was, what is the benefit of looking at food politics through the lens of optimism? How might this expand how the food movement strives for social change, and what should be the first interventions put in place? So we started out uh, with that first question just by annotating that, first of all, you have to be optimistic. Uh, nutrition, it will, it'll be a couple of, I have bulletined my responses, okay? So <laughs> um, our nutrition is uh, terrorizing our community. We talked about how diabetes, as for one thing, and just looking at how it's affecting our children, understanding that what you, can, what you eat now will determine the meds you have in the future. Uh, just annotating that you can destroy your life simply by what you put in your mouth. Isn't that something? And if children are our future, we need to make better investments in it. And it, it starts with that food health. 
Um, we talked about things like access, the chemicals in the food that we have, what is healthy, um, just annotating we have to change the trajectory of food goals and understanding the pipeline goals of what, what's out there and be able to adjust. And how do we, the last question was, what should be the first interventions put in place? It's about awareness, because when you are aware, you can begin to form an optimistic view. So education, awareness, acknowledgement, and action. And that's how we answer that. So. Scary. In, in, in the AKA. Okay, we have one more. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank my Delta sister, Dr. Malvo. Yeah, she, she doesn't like my outfit, but it's okay. She'll get over it. <laughs> but th this is a really wonderful, wonderful space. Space, yeah. So um, we had a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to go to the last one first. No, I'm going to go to where they, they told us to go. In your personal life history, how have you observed communities, governments, and organizations addressing food insecurity? And we all said that we've seen organizations and governments. And, but it's like one on it's not sustainable. We don't see it happening every day. We are going into the Thanksgiving and Christmas season. You're going to see that. But where is it in February and March and April? The other question, did they include the input of the people most at risk of hunger? Probably not. Probably not. And then, why is it important to acknowledge a people's life experience in social movements? How can it be a movement when you don't talk to the people? Um, I used to be a, a union organizer, and uh, I had the privilege of meeting some giants in the union movement, a Bill Lucy, who was in Memphis when Dr. King got killed. You can't do anything if you don't talk to the people. And you can't tell the people what to do. Ask them what they need and help them do that. That's about, that's movement. That's movement, that's civil rights movement, that is union movement, that is any movement. You got to ask the people what they want. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, definitely asking the people what they want. Who are those people? Who are those stakeholders that are involved? Um, if they're not at the people, table who can you continue to reach out to and go, go to those people. Um, one of my, I'm very grateful to have a wonderful conversation with my table. I have this beautiful picture that Darlene drew and um, hearing comments from Francine, Sharnita, our new, um, Phil, Phyllis and Francine, um, sharing stories about growing up in New York City and having food trucks come to you, um, having those services come to you if you can't get to them in those urban spaces. Um, let me start with the question that we had, actually. <laughs> um, imagine what food justice policy might look like in the future. What's the most important for those policies, and how might you involve the young people? And so just talking about bringing those services to you to go to those services, um, uh, hearing stories from Francine and Sharnita, bring in it from the season at that time, whether it was turnips or another season, uh, thinking about that. And then having those services come to you, that was one piece of policy that we can see in supporting groups like that. Another one is 
uh, how might we involve the young people, which is with those school systems, you know, with the I, I am Wanda from that, that, that vision of those third graders and creating something like a school garden, or if you're not gonna bring the outdoor space, bring it an indoor space. We talked about using like hydroponic gardening and um, it's similar to how you might, like I, growing up in elementary school, I took like a stuffed animal home, having a little bit of responsibility. Maybe we can give them a plant to take home, show them how to take, take care of it and grow something, a little bit of responsibility so that they can understand the importance of growing your own food and staying healthy and um, maybe share those alternatives with when they go to, uh, outdoors with their community and with their friends and parents. Mm. Another piece was like creating more courses, like home economic courses. We don't see those a lot in, in, in elementary school and middle school, as well as uh, just simplifying visuals for the kids, bringing back um, that we talked about the my plate and kind of seeing not just what's protein, not just meat, but also considering the power of plant-based so sources. Um, a great question posed by is like, what does a cow eat? What does an elephant eat, a bison eat? And they don't eat like the meat that we think of, it's that plant-based food. And last, lastly, uh, thinking about DC urban space, one of our speakers mentioned like having that garden and that outside that middle school, um, that two and a half acre garden. And if you're thinking about space, can we bring some of that indoors? And so that's what this picture is about, taking a plant home and maybe creating a food collective, a food space where you can involve all those stakeholders and thinking about um, who's growing your food, putting them in that space, where does your food come from was one of the, one of our, uh, someone brought up, where does your food come from? It's not just a grocery store, but who picked that food? who grew it, um, the, a lot of those folks might be illegal immigrants. And in Florida, for example, the coalition of Immokalee workers growing tomatoes. And so how do you provide a space for them to be able to, to take a bathroom break and um, go inside when it's thundering? And so the, in, in summary, just uh, for food justice policy, involving all those stakeholders at the table, bringing them into this kind of food collective space. If we can't have growing outdoors, maybe we can grow indoors and um, sort of in that hydroponic gardening. And then also teaching the kids, giving them a little bit of responsibility. Here, why don't you take a plant home? And that's, that's all. Thank you all. Yeah. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you for you all being wonderful audience members and just, want, just citizens of this world working with each other. So this concludes tonight's program. Um, I want to thank Atlantic Philanthropies um, for pro providing support for tonight's program. I want to thank um, the museum's public programs team, my team, for helping put this together, our special events team, um, members of public affairs who are taking photos and video me right now, so this will end up somewhere. Um, <laughs> and thank you all for coming out. So if you enjoyed yourself, please, 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 please scan the QR code on your table, provide us feedback. It helps us get better. It helps us sharpen our skills. It helps us make this more enjoyable for more people to enjoy and really learn learn a lot, but also share with us. So thank you again. Have a great evening. Have a wonderful wonderful weekend and a wonderful set of holidays coming up. God bless and good night.